Hi, it's the MLM for the Soul channel, and I do have a new topic for today. Before I begin, I just want to say, may the words and expressions of my mouth and the thoughts and meditations of my heart find favor and acceptance before you, Hashem, and some people to thank who have inspired me. I hope they can inspire you as well, and I will have links to their sites below this video so you can check them out. They are Rabbi Shalom Arash, Rabbi Lazer Brody, Rabbi Yosef Mizrahi, Rabbi Eli Mansur, Rabbi Alona Nava, Rabbi Yuval Ovadia, Rabbi Daniel Asur, Nisan Baruch Black, David Sachs, and Rabbi Michael Skobak, Jews for Judaism. And again, if you've never checked out this channel before and you want to know what MLM for the Soul is all about, and MLM stands for something as well, you can check out my first video, and I will have a link right below this video as well to check that out. So today is part four, the continuation of the Ramban's Musser letter from the book called A Letter for the Ages, uh, the Egeret HaRamban from the Art School series, and I will also have a link to uh, the Art School website so you can check out all that they offer. So we have three more uh, days to do, so we're going to start with day 10, and then I have my little chart here too. V'cha'asher tachshov et kol eile. And what this was referring to was from the one before um, about when we were talking about humility and anger. So after you give serious thought to these ideas, you will stand in awe of your Creator and will be guarded against sin. So uh, first paragraph, per perpetual need. The Torah commands, Et Hashem You shall fear Hashem, uh, and that's from Deuteronomy 10.20. And to live in awe of Hashem is a positive commandment, uh, one of the 613 uh, mitzvot. The mitzvah is constant, so it's one of the six constant mitzvot. It applies in all places, at all times, every moment of the day and night. The obligation devolves upon every member of the human race, Jew and Gentile alike. So it's for everyone. It's not just a commandment for the Jews had to do, so to be in awe. Although the mitzvah applies at all times, it is especially important to feel the awe of Hashem in situations that try our moral stamina. It is easier to overcome temptation when one realizes that Hashem watches human act actions and mournfully records every transgression. So when we know that and realize that Hashem is recording everything, and I think we've mentioned that previously um, in, uh, did we mention that? I think in day eight we took, talked about how everything is being accounted for. So therefore, once you kind of become more aware of that, you're, you're, you're apt to more think about that mitzvah that you have to stand in awe of Hashem. Next paragraph, the buried treasure. And now, Yisrael, what does Hashem, your G-O-D, ask of you? Only that you fear Him, fear Hashem. This is also from Deuteronomy 10, 12. The Silas Yesharim cites numerous sources which demand that one exert effort to learn how to serve Hashem with pure intent. The most essential ingredient, he writes, is striving to sense a genuine fear of heaven. So King Solomon stated, if you seek it out as you seek silver and search for it as you search for buried treasures, then you will comprehend the fear of Hashem. And this is from Mishlei Proverbs. He does not say, then you will comprehend philosophy, astronomy, medicine, etc. These pursuits, while commendable, are not the ultimate purpose, purposes of life. It is only comprehension of fear of Hashem which truly warrants incessant study and research. So that's what we really have to focus on. The other stuff is good. You know, maybe that's what you use to for your work or something, but don't dwell on that. Don't spend your whole life on that. That's not the important part, as, as Shlomo Hamel says. So Ms. Silas Yesharim suggests that one set aside a specific period of time in his daily schedule to contemplate a personal approach to the fear of Hashem. He also describes the process of acquiring fear of transgression. So what he says here, one should constantly make himself aware that the divine presence is found everywhere, and the Holy One blessed is he carefully watches everyone and everything great and small, so from the tiniest little creature to the biggest. <laughs> Nothing is hidden from his eyes. When one truly lives with this awareness, he is filled with awe. He genuinely fears acting in a manner which is not in accordance with the wishes of the Almighty. So when you know that he's watching everyone, you're, you need to be watching yourself as well, you know, and we all slip up. We're human. Hashem doesn't expect us to be perfect, only he is. So, but still, it, keep yourself on guard more. Next paragraph. Reverence and awe and active pursuit. Rab Yitzhak Blazer, finally known as Rab Itzla Prederberger, observed, it observes in his masterpiece, Or Yisrael, that by nature men are easily frightened. Uh, whenever, wherever man turns, he finds himself surrounded by either real or imaginary danger. He's afraid of crime and, co or competition, and of competition, afraid of the future and the unknown. 
He fears failure, sickness, poverty, pain, death. Uh, you know, this the list goes on and on. This thus it is curious is man, if man is is being is a being prone to fear, why does he not also live in awe and trepidation of the most powerful force in the world, the omnipotent um, one, Hashem, master of the universe? So it's interesting. I always look at it as because we can't see him. Other dangers we see. You know, if you if you're gonna cross the street when cars are going, you're gonna get hit. So that's something that's visually. Uh, aware, visual awareness you know if you put your hand if there's a flame and you put your hand in it you're going to get burned you see that you know that that's a danger but it's unfortunate with Hashem he's not visible so it's it's not it's not in front of us as much so what does he go on to say but lo in his daily life man seems not to take notice of his creator at all even those who scrupulously follow the dictates of Torah mitzvot as a whole seem not overly concerned about the sins they commit time and time again so Rabbi Yisrael Blazer explains that man's lack of natural fear of Hashem is indeed uh, unfathomable. Unfathomable. <laughs> Yet this strange phenomenon is, phenomenon is nonetheless the result of Hashem's perfect design. Hashem actually made it that way. How? The Creator purposely plucked fear of Hashem from man's heart so that humanity could enjoy its most precious privilege, the gift of Bechira Havshit, free will. So that's why he, he, if we always had fear of Him, nobody would be challenged we'd all live like robots like the malachim like the angels and that's not what we're here for we're here to overcome stuff that that's you know hard for us you know the, the temptations the challenges that's what we have to work on so if a man if man was overwhelmed by a natural and instinctive dread of the almighty he would unthinkably choose good evil would not be an option at all so thus by divine decree man does not fear hashem instinctively by instinct how does he fear him but he can acquire fear of hashem intellectually by actively seeking to recognize Hashem's dominance over every phase of life, man slowly fills his heart with reverence and awe. So it's not instinct it's not instinctive that he fear him, it's intellectually. By really by, by putting effort into it. It is only by his active and forceful pursuit that he becomes imbued with fear of Hashem. There is no other way. So indeed, just as Shalom Hamel says, if you seek it out as you seek silver and search for it as you search for buried treasure, then you comprehend. So what it is is we have to seek it out. It's not there for us by instinct just like we know don't cross the street when the cars are going by or something like that same thing that's the instinct you know if a dog is if something is chasing you you want to try to run away you know save yourself so that's what he's trying to say when he says if you seek it out that you have to spend time with it so next day 11 once you have acquired these fine qualities you will indeed be happy with your lot so, uh, finding contentment, what's the process? The Mishnah in Avos teaches that a truly rich person is one who is satisfied with his portion. Ezu Ashir in Hebrew is Ezu Ashir Asamech Bechelko. The Tana, however, stops short of offering guidance on how to acquire such satisfaction. Here in his ethical work, the Ramban systematically outlines the process of achieving contentment. First, he writes, one must remove anger from his heart. Serenity is impossible if one is easily agitated. So, you can't be serene and calm if you're always angry. The two just don't mix. Um, yet even after conquering anger, if one remains proud, continually seeking new glory, he similarly can never be satisfied. Thus humility becomes a vital component in the quest for peace of mind. So you have to have, um, remove anger, and then you also have to be humble in order to achieve this, uh, of being satisfied with what you have. The humble person also achieves contentment through his belief that Hashem controls all of life's events. One who believes that his affairs are controlled by chance feels cheated, despair follows quickly. If he understands that Hashem is close to his daily life, however, he trusts in his Creator's fairness. Even when events seem beyond his more, more, mortal comprehension, he is content in the knowledge that Hashem will deal with him justly. So no matter what, he knows Hashem controls everything, so he doesn't, you know, he, he stays content. Um, next paragraph, serenity despite travail. The Chavetz Chaim um, in Al HaTorah in Parshas Eschanan asks how a poor, poor and sick, sick person can be expected to be satisfied with blocks. You figure, wow, he's so destitute. Like, how can he be happy? You know, he has nothing. He provides the following illustration. A diamond cutter um, requires a delicate and expensive saw to cut his, his gems, and a lumberjack also needs a saw. But, the, but his instrument is large and rough, and the other is a different type of, it's very delicate. So, although the diamond saw is more expensive, if the lumberjack would use that, I'm just paraphrasing now, he would be a fool because 
it doesn't work for his, what he needs. It's gonna destroy. It's gonna. It's not gonna take care of the lumber, just like the the cutter for the diamond won't work on the on the on the on the logs. So similarly, the Almighty created every human being with a different mission in life, and invested each person with unique physical and emotional tools to carry out his mission. The rich man is supplied with wealth with which to serve Hashem through philanthropy. So that's his test, that Hashem gave you a lot of money. Why? So you should use it to do the right thing, to do good things, to help other people. On the other hand, Hashem provides each afflicted person with the strength to withstand suffering. The sick man serves Hashem by struggling with his illness, yet accepting his pain with serene faith, which is a challenge. It's, it's not easy. Uh, thus, poverty can be the bittersweet tool of a man's life's mission. Although the poor man may wish for wealth, it is, it is his ability to deal val valiantly with his lot that is his key to spiritual perfection. Hence, the person who comes to recognize his true mission in Hashem's world can become generally satisfied with the tools that are his portion and no one else's. So that's his portion. That's what he has to deal with. Don't try to look at other people's tools, like you were saying, like the diamond cutter and the lumberjack. His tools won't work for you, just like your tools won't work for him. So you have to work with what you have. Next paragraph. I like this one. This is called A City of Happiness, A State of Mind. Rabbeinu Asher in his Orach, Orchos Chaim makes this recommendation for developing a contented frame of mind. Desire that which your maker desires for you and rejoice in the portion he has chosen for you. When you pray, ask for only one thing, that Hashem inspire you to follow his teachings. As for everything else, cast upon Hashem your burden and he will sustain you. That's from Tehillim, that last uh, uh, sentence. So desire what he desires. Make Hashem's will your will. Then he'll make his will uh, then, if you make Hashem's will your will, then he'll make your will his will. That's how it goes. Uh, and Rab Avram Pam, the Rosh Yeshiva of Masif, the Torah Vadas, often quotes an old saying, and I like this one very much, and I never heard it before until I read it here. People search desperately all over the, wor all over the world. I oh, meant to say world. It said word. <laughs> a typo. They search all over the world to find a, quote, city of happiness, not realizing that it can be found in a state of mind. I like that a lot. In the, and then next paragraph, in the embrace of the Creator. In, his, in, the, in, in the Psalms to Hillam, King David shares with us his secret of serenity. So this is what he says, Hashem is my allotted portion and my share. You guide my destiny. Portions have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, my estate was lovely to me. I will bless Hashem who has advised me. So what is he saying here? Uh, king David was one of the most colorful personalities in Jewish history. He was a powerful king, a victorious warrior, an inspired composer, and a sagacious lawgiver. So he had everything pretty much. And I'm sure he wasn't poor. I doubt that. Uh, yet uh, David avowed that all his achievements were dwarfed by his progress toward his ultimate goal, establishing an intimate relationship with Hashem. So despite everything, that's what he longed for. Es es ecstatically, David HaMelech sings a song of gratitude. Indeed, a mortal can experience no greater delight than hence the embrace of the immortal creator. So that's all he longed for. Um, final uh, day, 12. When your actions display genuine humility, when you stand meekly before man and fearfully before Hashem. So, paragraph, first paragraph, honoring Hashem, honoring others. Rab Nassim Tzvi Finkel, known as the altar of Slabotka, uh, constantly emphasized that all men are precious, for they are made in the image of Hashem. When one showers others with kindness and respect, he thus also honors Hashem himself. Because don't forget, we're in the image of Hashem, so by us doing that, just like if we bring in guests, uh, we're honoring Hashem because he did that, you know, Hachnasas Archim, you know, come to see a guest. Like uh, when uh, Hashem came to see Avram Avinu when he had his bris milah. He came, but he went. It's, it's a greater uh, mitzvah to go and bring a guest in than it is to have Hashem as your guest because you're emulating him. That's a bigger thing. Um, uh, the first resolution recorded in the altar spiritual die was to try to be extremely careful of my fellow man's honor with patience, with a soft answer. Never once to get excited, to find ways daily, at the very least weekly, of benefiting my friends. Next paragraph, everyday striving. The Silas Yeshurim writes that although Hashem has endowed every individual with unique abilities, one should not become unduly proud on their account. Each advantage was meant to be shared. So, you know, someone could be very talented as a, a singer, a writer, a composer, and they want to brag about it. But don't forget, Hashem gave those to you to use for something good. Don't use them and boast about them. Use them for good things. 
you know, other people may give you uh, praise about them, but, you know, you always try to downplay it. You know, I always do. I say, credit to the creator. It's not from me. It's his, it's his gift. It's his genius, you know. Uh, he just blessed me with that so I could use it. And to help others and to, you know, make the world, uh, you know, more spiritual and holy place. So what does he say here, Monsieur Lachacharm? One who is wealthy may rejoice in his lot, but at the same time he must help those in need. If one is strong, he must assist the weak. The situation of the world is similar to a large household, where there are many different servants assigned to different tasks. Each servant must fulfill his own appointed chore if the affairs and needs of the household are to be managed properly. There is really no room for pride here, so each one has a different task. You know, like in a house, you have a cook, people have servants, people have maids, you know, or housekeepers, however you want to call them, uh, you know, a gardener, you know, a driver. So all of them have to do their tasks. They can't do someone else's tasks, and all of them come together and, and fulfill everything um, that's needed to be done. And, 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 and collectively, they do every, get everything done. Further on, the Messiah Shisharm develops an axiom to monitor one's response to fortune. So he says here, as one's wealth increase, his, increases, his pride should wane. His situation is similar to that of a beggar who accepts gifts of kindness, yet is also humbled because of them. The more he receives, the greater his feelings of indebtedness. Thus, uh, David Amel reacts to Hashem's kindness by saying, and this is from Tehillim too, how can I repay Hashem for all his kindness to me? You know, just the fact that we could breathe. You know, that we can go on for a trillion, inf infinity years thanking Hashem for every little thing that we can't even describe, like, that encompasses our whole, like, let's say, just our physical body. It's endless. Um, so, there's not, how, how can I repay him? Like, what, what can I give him? He has everything, right? He's infinite. He's... He's, you know, supreme. There's nothing you can give someone like that. The only thing I say we can give to him is just doing his will. That's what we do. That's, that's how we can uh, repay him, by doing his will. Um, in addition to being a giant in Torah knowledge, Rav Moshe Feinstein was also a paragon of piety and wonderful midos. Indeed, someone once asked Rav Moshe, in what merit had he become so revered by all Jews? He replied, I have never knowingly caused any hurt to another human being. Now, that's huge. Um, and that's very hard to do. Um, his respect for others manifested itself on a daily level. Um, and I'll just paraphrase the story to you. So he was walking and uh, he failed. Uh, so um, one man recalled how he had once failed to notice him as he walked by, like he was walking and he didn't notice him. So ten steps later, he turns around, comes back to greet the man, and just to make up for it, he actually spent time talking with him. Another time, uh, Ramosha was walking through the lobby of his apartment building, and a woman held the front door open for him. And then the next day, when he was in the lobby, he noticed that same woman approaching the door, and instead he rushed over to open the door. And she was like, no, 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 she, you know, he wanted to give him respect. She knew who he was, but he insisted, and he opened the door for her. A final paragraph, erasing the traces of arrogance. Um, after concluding an address to a gathering on the east side, Ramosha quickly made his way towards the exit. As he neared the door, the chairman of the gathering introduced the next speaker, a respected rabbi of the east side congregation. So again, I'm going to continue paraphrasing. So Rav Moshe stopped the door, and then he took, turned around and took his seat back to, uh, you know, uh, for the duration of, of this Rav's, you know, talk, because he feared that someone might misinterpret his leaving as, um, like, he didn't care for this Rav, and he didn't want that to come out that way. Um, and then further on, someone also who assisted Reb Moshe for many years, for a number of years, asked him, why do you permit calls to disturb you, your learning during the day? Shouldn't you better just like set hours, like set certain times for people to call you? So what did Reb Moshe say? Um, he said, there is a trace of arrogance in telling someone that I cannot be disturbed, that he must call me at my, back at my convenience. That's not for me. So he didn't believe that that was okay to do. I'm sorry, there is one more final paragraph called The, the Preferred Seat. So this is a story about how Rab Moshe and Rab Yaakov Kamenetsky, after they finished a meeting, they were discussing for a few minutes before entering a waiting car. They were going together. So as they took their seats, Rab Yaakov chose to sit next to the driver, and Rab Moshe sat in the back. So uh, Rab Moshe was the one who, who uh, left first. And then Rab Yaakov explained to the driver the reason for their delay. He said, we were, we were discussing who was getting off first. And we decided that person would sit in the back, which was Rav Moshe. And because he said, were he to sit in the front and then I would be in the back, you know, I would be, uh, you would be left alone 
uh, in the front, and it would be look like as if you were nothing more than the chauffeur. So he, they didn't want to treat him just out of respect. I mean, that's amazing. Like they didn't, they thought they spent time thinking about things like that. That they figured this is not right. We need to do something. You know, the humility. So it just shows you how humble they were. And I just want to say in closing that I hope and pray we can all emulate these great Sadiqim by like a fingernail. I don't even know if we could do that much, but we could learn from them and really apply this to our own lives as much as possible and, and you know, make improvements. And I hope and pray that in the merit of everyone coming together with Achdus and Ahava and, and doing the right thing for Hashem, uh, that we will merit to live and see the coming of Mashiach speedily in our days and the rebuilding of the final everlasting base Hamigdash. Amen. And thank you for watching.